welcome to our webinar and conversation with the Honorable Pierre Pettigrew. We are very appreciative of our partner and chamber member, Deloitte Canada, for bringing this opportunity forward. And I'm sure that everybody watching will enjoy this engaging conversation. In a moment, I will welcome Catherine Parsons Demija, partner at Deloitte Canada based in the Halton office, on screen to offer a full introduction of our guest today. Following Catherine's introduction, the Honourable Pierre Pettigrew will provide brief opening remarks, focusing on the state of Canada-US relations and our global economy. Mr. Pettigrew will then be joined on screen for an in-depth discussion led by Tim Cadigan, past chair of the board and current host of our Oakville Chamber produced television show, Conversations. On that note, I would like to thank Catherine for her support and welcome her onto the screen. Thank you so much, Drew. Um, in my role, uh, I'm the leader of Southwestern Ontario's marketplace for Deloitte, um, as well as I serve my own clients in my specialty area of human capital. And it's my absolute pleasure to be joining you today um, as Deloitte has been a supporter of the Oakville Chamber of Commerce for a number of years. I myself have lived in Oakville for over 15 years with my family and playing a role in our community where we live and work is so very important. At Deloitte, we're pleased to work with many leaders in your community, uncovering new opportunities and being a part of their growth journeys. With over 8,000 local businesses and its proximity to Toronto, Oakville is in a privileged position for growth and development. More recently at Deloitte, we are increasing our focus and investment on serving clients in the mid-market. Many of our clients in Southwestern Ontario fit that definition. Beyond the traditional day-to-day -day accounting and tax work, which of course we do, we serve our clients locally through a variety of services, such as mergers and acquisitions, finance transformation, IT or systems integration, just to name a few. If you'd like to chat about Deloitte's presence in Oakville and what we have to offer to the mid-market, please reach out to me. We'd always be happy to discuss. And now to the matter at hand. 2020 has been an extraordinary year, unlike any we've seen in our lifetime. But with that, I approach 2021 with optimism. I'm sure many of you do too. As Canada and the rest of the world shift from responding to this crisis, to recovery and rebuilding, we recognize how important it is for businesses to build a more resilient and thriving future for themselves and for the country. Beyond the global pandemic, I'm sure many of us are eager to better understand how the most recent political changes south of the border will impact us here in Canada. And there is no one better suited to help make sense of all these changes than the Honorable Pierre Pettigrew. Pierre, of course, is a former member of parliament and federal cabinet minister. And he's had great success in both the public and private sectors. And he has a strong voice for business on international trade issues. In addition, Pierre is a part of Deloitte as an executive advisor. How lucky are we? I am thrilled to be introducing Pierre today and welcoming him back to Southwestern Ontario, where he has presented a number of times before. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Pierre Pettigrew to Oakville today. Thank you so much, Catherine. Delighted to be to be with you. Sorry that it is virtual, but I'm looking forward to uh, have these meetings again. So I've been invited to set the table for a few minutes, and uh, then we will engage in a conversation with uh, Tim Cadigan. Uh, Catherine is quite right. 2020 was a, it was a challenging year for all of us and at every, every level, uh, business-wise, family-wise, our friends. Uh, we have had to learn a lot of stuff. I do believe that essentially what we have to notice is that uh, this uh, COVID crisis will have accelerated a number of trends that were already in the picture, but the digitalization and all kinds of elements that uh, the role of the government back in our lives, another acceleration of a trend that has been existing for some time. So 2021 will be a year of, of transition transition beyond uh, COVID as we are, you know, beginning to vac vac with vaccination. And this is, you know, very good news. What I would really want to uh, call your attention on for 2021, transition beyond COVID, but transition beyond 
uh, the Trump administration now that uh, President Biden has formed his new administration. This is a very significant transition for Canada. It, no other relationship matches the importance of this bilateral relationship. I would say it, it, that the Biden administration and the Trudeau government will have remarkable policy alignment, which was not the case in the past four years. Remarkable policy alignment, because if you look at the platform and the electoral program of the Biden uh, campaign, and if you look at the cabinet that he has installed in the past few weeks, there are remarkable policy alignment with what uh, Prime Minister Trudeau has been trying to achieve here in Canada. So very strong policy alignment won't mean that there won't be a few irritants here and there. It, there always are. But by and large, there will be remarkable policy alignment. I will also call your attention on the fact that we will now have predictability in Washington. Uh, we, we, not only do we know uh, President Biden very well, uh, Biden is a very normal man, very experienced, traditional po po political leader. So he will be quite predictable. We will know how to present our case to him. And not only he is he predictable, but his, his team is. The, the ministers, the secretaries he's appointed are, are known quantities to our Canadians, uh, Canadian leaders and Canadian diplomats. And therefore, uh, normalcy will be uh, very appreciated. I will say that we all also will have a welcome mat at the door of the White House. Uh, Kamala Harris lived in Canada. Uh, Kamala Harris lived in Montreal for five years and, and keeps very fond memories of, of her stay here in Canada. We will have a welcome mat at the door of the White House. A few words on China because the way uh, President Trump was dealing with China very confrontational. We were sort of sleepwalking towards a Cold War with China, which would have very badly affected Canada, of course, as a Pacific country. We need to engage with all of Asia. Uh, and of course, with the rise of China, we have to take that into account. But whereas President Trump confronted China very much unilaterally, one on one, uh, you will see President Biden challenging China along with France, Germany, European Union, with Great Britain, Canada, Japan, Australia, and like-minded countries. And I think that a return to the WTO dispute settlement body, uh, there are more possibilities of extracting economic concessions from China if we go to the WTO, uh, reinvigorated by US leadership, along with other allies. So I will stop here, Tim. Uh, I just thought we should set the table. But of course, I'm quite available to go wherever you believe this conversation should be going for our members. Well, first of all, thank you very much for doing this, Mr. Pettigrew. It's a, it's a pleasure to see you. And uh, yes, virtually, unfortunately. But let's jump right in on the U.S.-Canada relationship. You talked about uh, the policy alignment. Can you be a little more specific about where we might see some of that alignment between the government's priorities and what the Biden administration and coming into uh, their term uh, will be? Listen, the, the, if, you, if you look at, at the uh, environment, climate change. Uh, President Biden has already indicated in executive order that he would re-engage with the Paris uh, Climate Accord. And the uh, Biden seems to want to walk the same tight rope between energy and environment than, than Justin Trudeau has been to play. And I believe that we will be able to think as North Americans here, as we are more like-minded in the right balance to find around some energy sovereignty and respect of the climate and commitments around the world. Uh, if you look at uh, healthcare, this is a big priority for the uh, Biden administration. It's, it's closer to us. Uh, I, I think that uh, the, uh, the vast, the, the deep way of dealing with COVID 
very different from what the Trump administration was doing on the COVID. I think you will see a more engaged government on that front. I think on international trade, uh, as you know, Canada and our government in Ottawa has always promoted multilateralism, which is the rule of law for mid-sized countries like us, uh, can't afford to be bullies and we're Canadians. Our DNA doesn't shape us to be bullies. So having the rule of law, uh, reinvigorating the WTO, I think on international trade, Canada is heading a group of countries that want some reform of the WTO. Not sure we'll extract a lot um, Biden on that front, but he will certainly reinvigorate the dispute settlement body. So these are all alignments on which we will be able to work very closely as we are quite like-minded. And so it's interesting to me to think about the relationship between uh, our government and the government of the US. And so looking back over the last four years, for instance, uh, if the president put a, a, a tariff on goods it didn't feel like we had an ability to have a, engage in a conversation. That if anything, we had to react to that. Uh, I think the government uh, did exactly what you said. They walked a, a bit of a tightrope in dealing with him. Uh, that's changed now and our ability to negotiate. So, so what does that mean for Canada as we go forward? That those relationships now are in place and that the person sitting at the, you know, in the Oval Office is, is perhaps more open to that conversation. Very much, very much so, very much so. President Biden thinks like that. He thinks in terms of allies. He knows that the United States strength in the world uh, when it wants to challenge China, it is far more powerful when the United States is not only the United States alone or you know America first, but when it is actually uh, aligning itself and leading you know NATO and all of the alliances that uh, that country is in favor. For us, uh, Biden has an immense respect for Justin Trudeau personally. Uh, Trudeau was very, uh, very lucky in a way because when he became prime minister, he gave a, a state dinner to President, Vice President Biden who was leaving the White House and they hit it up very well from there. So, you know, when you go to someone who is open to you, and to someone who's predictable, because he's a very normal man. I mean, you, you, with the president, with the former president Trump, you never knew, you know, if it was a good day or a bad day, or what, what, what would be there. So we will be able to put our case in a very kind of professional way, and can expect a professional answer uh, rather than instinct and emotions and prejudices. You know, one of the things I've been trying to get my head around over the last uh, couple of weeks is this. Uh, normally, when an administration leaves the White House, that chapter closes and comments made on the world stage don't seem to have the same uh, importance as they would have if that person was perhaps running for a second term. Uh, in this case, and just what you said, you know, his uh, President Trump's uh, thin skin, uh, his, his, you know, unpredictable nature based on comments made internationally, does it change our ability to talk to the Biden administration based on the fact that Trump is still talking about his potential to come back in four years and running? We, we, we have to do everything we can to help President Biden succeed because you are right. Uh, Trump, Trump continues to be a very strong political force. I mean, normally a former president simply vanishes building his library and doing some saying nice things and never criticizing his uh, successors and not intervening in any kind of way. So uh, with, this is a very different situation. We have a man who is uh, down in Mar-a-Lago, but quite determined to be a major force and the Republican party uh, seems to, We'll see what the Republican Party does in the end, but it really does look that uh, uh, Trump will be a big, big, big force for years to come. So essentially, for us, it's very important that Biden succeeds if we want to continue to have that kind of normalcy. Uh, otherwise, and presidents normally don't do well at the midterm elections. So, I mean, by, the interesting thing in this result is that 
Trump in 2016, no one saw him come. He won, but he was really, he won as a disruptor, but people said, well, Washington deserves a big kick and we, he will grow to the job and the Oval Office will shape him. Well, they did not. He remained exactly who he is. He challenged all of the institutions, possible and impossible. What is amazing is that after all that, and even after Americans knew that he would not be shaped by the role, uh, he still got 10 million more votes than he did in 2016. Now, what's interesting is that as much as he's supported, more people, 81 million came out to kick him out of office. That's never been seen. So he mobilizes not only his base, but he mobilizes the Democrats to get out. And indeed, we have to take that into our calculations he, he, because we don't know the future as a country you always have. I think that Trudeau, Freeland, those who dealt with the Trump administration did an extraordinary job of self-discipline. Uh, they should continue to do that while, however, um, making sure that we work very constructively with the Biden administration and do everything we can that it succeeds. Okay, that's enough on Trump. Let's try not to talk about him again for the next little while. Uh, I want to circle back, though, to your comment at the start uh, when you, you mentioned Biden's uh, environmental policy. And one of the first uh, actions he took uh, after being inaugurated uh, was his executive order to kill the Keystone Project. Uh, Alberta's Jason Kenney, of course, has come out uh, very strongly opposed to that action. He's calling for uh, to be paid by the states for, for damages. Uh, he actually said that he wanted to go to war over Keystone. Um, what is the impact for the Keystone project for Canada, never mind uh, just Alberta, but for, for, the, for the Canadian economy and specifically for our relationship with the Biden administration again? It's a big, it's very frustrating. I mean, you know, I do believe honestly that Keystone contributed again with 70 other pipelines that we already have uh, between Canada and the United States. Uh, North American energy sovereignty is wonderful because it makes you independent of whatever happens in the Middle East and this and that. So I, I certainly agree that it was a very frustrating decision announced the first day. However, Obama had vetoed it before. Biden was his vice president. Biden has the smallest majority in the House. And as you know, the 2016 caucus of Democrats is pretty left wing. He needs to give them something. So at one stage, if private companies want to sue the United States and this and that, I would certainly, I mean, that's their right and they should look into compensations. I don't think Canada should engage in sanctions. I think it would be a terrible mistake. I, I, Biden knows all of the positive arguments about Keystone and he's, he's, in a way it's a great service that he announced at the very first day. So it's there, uh, we object. I believe that we should focus on the opportunities that the policy alignment offers us. I think Prime Minister Trudeau wants to keep that welcome mat at the White House to negotiate the rules of the Buy American Procurement Program. It's huge government procurement by American. Trudeau wants to keep his access to the president to make it as much North American by North American rather than narrowly American. And I think that is where we should insist the opportunities uh, rather than spending too much saliva on something on which we know he will not change his mind. It's tough to imagine a purely by American policy working, given how, uh, you know, in linked we are with their economy, how many products travel across the border, raw materials go to one country to be uh, fashioned into something to send back to the original country to be Im implemented or installed into something. It's very difficult to imagine uh, a by American policy working given how integrated we are. I totally agree with you. And this is where I believe the government of Canada sh should be focusing at this time. We've had great practice with the NAFTA two negotiations where uh, the, the prime minister built a strong team Canada uh, that he led coordinated by Christian Freeland, premiers of the provinces came in, uh, worked with the governors and uh, the chambers of commerce and business association 
So we Americans need to be explained exactly what you described is that that integration um, is very, very positive and constructive for the US and for Canada. And they would benefit a much better government procurement if they um, had this Canadian contribution. So in 2010, even if the relationships between Harper and Obama was not fantastic, uh, we could still at that time negotiate exemptions in 37 states. So my view is that it, th th this is why I was saying around the Keystone, let's try to keep the mood as positive and constructive as possible because of the Made in, made Amer in America rules of the Buy American Act, this is really where we want to score points. I want to uh, shift now to talking more about the Asia market. And, and in your opening remarks, you talked about the fact that we were sleepwalking to a potential Cold War with China. What's changed then? Uh, the Biden administration, obviously, but, but so you feel that we're not walking towards a Cold War now. How has that, how has that changed? Well, we're talking about clearly the, the Americans have become more protectionist and clearly Americans have uh, evolved on their understanding of China's role in the world. Uh, sometimes people say, oh, President Obama was naive and we and our own government were naive. It's not the case. Well, it is, it is China that has changed under President Xi. In our years, when we negotiated China's integration in the international order, that was a major, major improvement of international affairs when they joined the United Nations and stopped supporting terrorism around the world, um, and now are the second largest contributor to Blue Helmets and peacekeeping forces. And uh, they, they became members of the International Monetary Fund of the World Bank, and members of the WTO. All that contributed to the growth of the world economy. Now, now, President Xi is now reneging on many economic reforms that his predecessors had committed to as members of the WTO. Uh, we need to bring back uh, a, the uh, commitments that the Chinese had made. And I think Biden's approach is far more constructive because it will be at the WTO uh, where the rule of law applies. The Chinese need access to the world economy because the only legitimacy of the Communist Party of China is economic growth. If they don't have access to the world economy, they're in deep trouble. So uh, another reason why I said that, Tim, is that, that, that Biden is no longer sleepwalking to a Cold War is that when he recognizes that China needs to be challenged, he also always carves areas of cooperation with China. Uh, on nuclear um, proliferation, North Korea, on climate change, where the Chinese for the first time a few months ago made commitments on gas emissions. So he, is, he says, yeah, we'll challenge you on economic uh, reforms. And your state, state capitalism is not respecting the WTO rules. But he also says, let's work together on nuclear proliferation or climate change. And that balance I find is uh, healthier. I wanna quote you again. Uh, you said that uh, Canada's relationships across Asia are key to maintaining our current standard of living and our economy as a whole. Why is that? Well, it, 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 as much as the 20th century was Europe's century and the Atlantic community really ran the world, we're moving west. We, but the Pacific is, is going to be the busiest uh, ocean. Uh, the, the demography is in Asia. The growth is in Asia. Uh, the research in science is in Asia. There are more scientific papers doc, uh, published in Asia than there is in Europe and the United States year after year. So uh, Asia will pose challenges to us. The rise of China needs to be uh, it will happen, the rise of China. Whether we like it or not, it will happen. Let's make sure that it happens respecting the international order that we've built in the last 75 years. And this is why I'm so much more comfortable with the president, president of the United States now who wants to, uh, uh, to, to reinforce that international order. And we have very good arguments to get China in. But China is a lot more, uh, Asia is a lot more than China. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the Trudeau government signed the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, 
and uh, there are lots of fantastic uh, business opportunities there as well. You know, the 21st century will be Asian and we Canadians are so lucky to also be a Pacific country that we should uh, certainly have that tail to Asia. So I want to separate uh, the bulk of Asia and bring China out for this part of the conversation. And specifically, I want to talk about uh, what I would say is a gap in our worldview. Uh, you know, it feels like for several years that we've been bullied by China. You know, they're holding, and today, the day we're recording this is actually the 800th day that they've held two Canadians hostage. Uh, obviously, there's differences in the, the uh, deficit of the trading that we do with China. Uh, I think our whole worldview as Canadians is different, yet we continue to use them as, or, or to consider them to be a strong trading partner. There was an article in McLean's that talks about the policy around Ottawa, has always been the policy around Ottawa, that it's best to keep our heads down and behave the way Beijing wants in hopes of winning favorable trade concessions. Can we get out of that posture? We, we have to respect our values. We have to affirm and, and assert our values all the time. And clearly, the evolution of the last few years in China, since President Xi took over, is, 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 has to be a major concern for us. The only way we can progress if we engage. And when I see this rhetoric of saying, you know, we should not engage with them and we should not do anything anymore, uh, I don't agree with that. I mean, should we review even in trade? I mean, you know, global supply chains at the beginning of the COVID uh, were far more resilient than I would have thought. Do we want more sovereignty and pharmaceutical? I, I believe we do. I mean, you know, beyond vaccine, Canadians were flabbergasted to hear that 100% of the penicillin we use comes from China. Hello. I mean, however, uh, the PPEs and ventilators, of course, everyone, everyone wanted them at the same time in March. Even if we had that local production, wouldn't that ch change the reality? There was a bottleneck there. So I believe that when we realize how much the world economy has been damaged by COVID, if, we, if, if, if the United States wants to recover and its economy launched again in, in, in Canada, we need consumption to be there. And the, and the contribution of the Chinese to the ability of citizens to consume is very significant. I mean, you know, Walmart, uh, if your washing machine costs $100 more, a few will buy them. And if your television costs $500 more because it's local production, we have to find the right balance. And we do trade that, that what I have a problem with right now is when we focus only on China. Uh, we've been do, do, doing a lot of trade with a lot of regimes that I really, really don't appreciate. Uh, it's heartening for me to hear you talk about the, the collection of like-minded countries and, and the ability perhaps to bring some of these regimes uh, back to the table and to a more respectful uh, engagement on the world stage. I only have a couple minutes left. Uh, I know you were heavily involved in our negotiations uh, with Europe, and I, I wanted to, to get your take on Brexit right now. Obviously, it's still in, in its infancy with uh, the European Union and, and Britain separating, but, but what implications does that have for, for Canadian businesses? Very significant. You know, when one thing that I am preoccupied with is that now that Britain has left the um, European Union and the single market, uh, Brussels risk becoming more protectionist. The French and the, and the Germans are not as pro-free trade as, as the Brits were and kept Brussels in that direction. So I'm, uh, yeah, I was, I was the Prime Minister's special envoy on the Canada-European Union trade agreement. So I've spent a lot of time with them. And what is wonderful with this CETA arrangement and so good for our Canadian businesses and exporters is that even if protectionism r rises in the European Union, we have a bilateral protection. We have a bilateral trade route already negotiated. As a matter of fact, Tim, if you look at it, Canada is very well positioned because we are the only G7 country that has a free trade access 
to every other G7 economy. We, we have this with the United States through NAFTA or CARSMA as we call it. We have it with the European Union economies, Germany and France. We have it with British by extension, and we have it with Japan through the Canada, uh, through the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. So even if protectionism is on the rise, and I hope it won't be too much on the rise, but we already have uh, free trade access to all of these economies with established rules. So with the career you've had, I'd be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to ask you about Canada's standing in the world. I think we see ourselves as polite and nice. What does the world see us as? Canada's credibility is pretty good. Uh, almost everywhere we go, there are a few countries where our, in, our brand is not so highly regarded or respected. I mean, you know, but by and large, by and large, the Canadian brand is very well liked. Uh, you know, we're seen as North Americans, but very polite, as you say, and that, that is much appreciated. People appreciate a great deal the international contributions we've made over the years. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, I'll name him Pascal Lamy, who was the uh, European Trade Minister when I was Canada's Trade Minister and then became uh, Director General of the WTO. He told me one, one thing I really like uh, with you Canadians is when I am to meet a Canadian whom I don't know, I don't even know who will come in uh, the room. Is it a, a white man? Or is it an a, a, a Asian descent? Someone with you know a, a, a background? He said, diversity really works for you Canadians, and you are represented at all levels at a very high level. Now, can, can understanding and the re-engagement of the last few years uh, put, puts us at a very good. You know, our brand is good. And the quality of our products, the quality of the service we follow up with, I, I, I'm pretty impressed with what I see almost everywhere around the world. Well, we have to leave it there. I want to thank you very much for your time. My pleasure, Tim. Thank you. It was great meeting you. On behalf of the Oakville Chamber of Commerce, thanks for tuning into this virtual discussion today. And I wish you all the best for a productive day.